So welcome everybody, sorry for this uh, delay, everything was working 20 minutes ago and all of a sudden stopped working. Anyway, uh, my name is Radosław Szymgielski and I'm working for Nokia. Uh, I'm part of something what is called a cloud band team and uh, I'm working on uh, CBIS. Nokia CBIS stands for the cloud band infrastructure server, right? Uh, so why this talk? OpenStack is complex. Everybody knows about this. Probably nobody wants to argue about this here, right? Anybody? No. Guys, I want to make this session interactive. If anyone has any question, just give me a shout, raise your hand, and, and jump to the microphone, and we can, we can discuss. Or maybe after the session. Uh, so the performance of the OpenStack is even more complex than OpenStack itself. Uh, and what is the session about? It's about some kind of experience I, I had. Okay? I, I was given a task uh, when uh, I was given a big setup. And on that setup, I was going to work on scalability. When, uh, and while I was working on the scalability, I just hit few. I'm oh, sorry. Mm, probably I should type the password. Oh, crap. So while I was working on the scalability, problems. I hit also a few problems with the performance and, and uh, along the way I was trying to resolve the problems and this is what I want to present with you for, and, and, and share the experiences, right? Um, so the main thing which I was going to talk about is what the hell my controller is doing, okay? There's, there's a quite a lot of process running on the controller and uh, when you look closer on the, on, the, on the process you can actually learn a lot and this is, this is what the talk is going to be about. Uh, also, the default configuration, which you get in, like, when you install the OpenStack, usually you get, you run some kind of defaults. The defaults are, well, the defaults are to have a one purpose, basically. They just basically let you install the OpenStack, which is running out of the box. Nothing more, right? But, but if you have something more, you have to actually start digging and just, like, doing some work to optimize these controllers. Uh, so don't trust the vendor's defaults, right? A uh, few tip and tip, tips and tricks. Uh, uh, and why and how, right? So, so basically, there's, with the OpenStack, it is important what kind, what kind of workload you're working, you, you, you're running on your OpenStack. I'm, I'm coming from Nokia and the CBI is a platform for the telco type of application, but it probably will be kind of similar or maybe you can apply the same rules for your type of application, whatever you're running on top of OpenStack. But like my, my talk was and my experiences, my, my, my measurements were done on some kind of like a telco grade OpenStack. And uh, I probably should apologize because uh, when I was submitting the, 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 the subject for that, for that session, actually I put a few more points and when I realized that this is just a 20, uh, sorry, 40 or 45 minutes, I realized uh, there's no way how I can squeeze everything in that short time of, uh, short window time, right? So, uh, and I also assume that, like, this is, this is going to be a little bit advanced talk, so I assume that you guys know, for example, what's, I don't know, CPU context switching or what are the CPU registers and stuff like that, okay? This is, maybe I'll just spend a few seconds to just explain this, but I assume that you guys know about this, right? Uh, so what was my platform? So uh, like, I was, like I was saying, I was given the real hardware, which was 72 servers in two racks. The servers are, were Nokia airframes, uh, 48 CPUs, 256 gig of RAM. Uh, I installed the OpenStack using the triple O. Uh, so in the triple O, you have this concept of undercloud. I don't know if you're familiar with the, uh, under cloud, uh, with the triple O, but you have this concept of this management server, which is called undercloud. I use, of course, the three controllers, the standard HA configuration, and 68 computes, right? So I, I was left with the 68 computes. I installed everything. Well, there was a few obstacles along the line when I was installing this, uh, but that's probably subject for completely different talk, right? I'm not going to talk about this here. Uh, and my workload, what I was running on this setup. So after I installed it, I wanted to work it hard. I wanted to smash it. Just put it on the ground, start make the controller sweating as much as possible, right? So that was my goal. I was using just fairly like a rather small VMs, just between one and four CPU. Uh, RAM was between half and two gigs of, of RAM, so not that much, using zero CentOS 7 or Fedora 24 images. 
And with Telco, you usually you can expect that you have at least, uh, well, four network interfaces, probably like a minimum. All the telecom applications usually have multiple network interfaces. So this is why I was putting like between four and eight network interfaces to every single, every single VM, okay? Uh, the IPv4 and IPv6 dual stack probably doesn't matter too much. Uh, but I was using the heat. So in heat, I created f like a few complex stacks. Uh, the idea was to just make the heat working hard. And, and with the heat, I was creating like the, every single resource was put into the separate net nested stack. You had this kind of nice tree of resources uh, where every single, like, I don't know, disk network was in the separate resource. And that actually makes the heat working hard. And uh, the second type of workload which I was running was basically like I was creating the VM in bars. So I was just like a submit, I don't know, 100, 200, 300, 400 VMs at one time. Okay? Nova has this nice parameter, which is uh, Nova boot. And there you have a um, pool, dash dash pool or something like that. I don't remember by heart right now the parameter. But it basically uh, create all the VMs like in parallel. Okay? So I was really trying to put the controllers on the ground. That was my main goal. Right? And on the, at the end of the day, on this 68 servers, I create about 3,500 VMs. There was about 3,000 VMs running constantly, but I hit 3,500 VMs. So I didn't want to like, uh, hit record of the number of the VMs on the single OpenStack installation. I was probably far away from that record, right? That wasn't my goal. But the 3,000 is because like, in telco application, you don't really have this kind of like a, uh, overcommitment. They, they, they don't overcommit CPU. They don't like overcommit CPU. They don't like overcommit RAM. Okay? So that was the goal, right? I probably could put more VMs on that, sen on that environment, but yeah, that was the telco type of installation, right? So this is just uh, this three, three and a half thousand VMs, right, at the end of the day. Right, so first look on the controllers. So before I even started like uh, putting the workload, putting the VMs, putting the heat stacks on it, I just install it and start looking around, okay? So I, I log in on one of the controllers and start looking, okay, uh, so how many actually processes is running on this controller? And I realized that this 1,100 around processes running on single controller, okay? Mm, that's a quite a lot, I would say, right? At least for me. The next thing which was surprising for me is like uh, the load. The load on the controller, on completely idle controller, okay? The controller just doing some just housekeeping, nothing else, nothing more was the load was between 4 and, five, on, and 15. I don't know if anyone actually start like, uh, doing similar kind of experiments, like, keeping, like checking the load on the idle controllers, all right? But it was, it was also quite high. And for example, the next thing which was surprising for me was the, the high number of context switching, okay? The 40, 50,000 context switching per second, that's kind of a lot. Even, even if, you, if, you, if you have this 48 CPUs, 40, 50,000 context switching per second, that's, that's, that's a lot, okay? So I start from something simple, right? And uh, uh, what the graphs, there are two graphs, okay? So there's one con controller zero and controller one. I took two controllers only because uh, I wanted to squeeze this on the screen and, and I was afraid that if I'll put three graphs, it will be hard to actually read it. So just uh, I used as example two controllers only. Uh, what the graphs is show, uh, on the horizontal line, you have a time, six hour time, and over the six hours, I created all the VMs and created all the stacks and so on and so on. You can see the spikes where the, probably I was just like uh, putting some VMs on the, uh, uh, on the open stack. And the thing is that like initially when I start like uh, when I drop this bomb, like 400 VMs, of course it failed the first time, okay? I, I had to do a little bit of tweaking, and at the end of the day, I was able to create almost 500 VMs at one time, okay? But that's a different story. So anyway, you have, this, you have the spikes, but in general, you can see that the, the average load is about, I don't know, about 10, probably a little bit more than 10 all the time, okay? Which doesn't look right to me. So the next graph, what it shows is basically, like, uh, this is exactly, again, the controller zero and controller one, and you have a number of processes running on every single, con on, on both controllers, okay? So you have, a, you have about uh, uh, 1,060, 1,070 
processes is running in the same time. Actually, maybe the running pro word is not the right word. Actually, they are exist on the controller, okay? Uh, the running is not the right word because basically, then I start looking, okay, so how many actually processes is actively running? Because there is a difference. Usually the process is, I don't know, sleeping or doing nothing or waiting on something, and most of the, most of the processes. And this graph actually shows how many of the processes running on the OpenStack controller are doing some real work, okay, at the one time. And what is interesting on this graph, again, like the average value of the actively running processes on the controller uh, is about, well, it's between 10 and 15, yes? Uh, this graph is scaled to 48, from 0 to 48. To 48 because actually, like I said, my, 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 my servers has 48 CPUs, okay? That's, that's, that's the main reason why. And uh, you can barely see some kind of, if you would just draw the virtual line in the middle of this graph at the level of 24 virtual CPU, there's a barely any dot above, above this kind of virtual line, which, which, which means that most of, the, uh, most of the processors are actually running with like a half of the power which they have. And, and my feeling was that it has to be somehow correlated to the hyper-trading, right? Because, yeah, I had I, hyper-trading and I belong this. So uh, what I did, I said, uh, let me do something crazy. In every single, I don't know, OpenStack guide, I don't know if any performance guide exists for OpenStack, probably not, not yet. But uh, if you had any problems with performance or anything like that, you very often can hear that just increase the number of workers, okay? So you have this, you do have this uh, Keystone workers, Nova workers, and so on, so on, right? These parameters. But uh, like in my case, I try to do something else because all this context switching, this, this, this load on the idle controllers makes me thinking that this is not the right way to go. And I know that it sounds controversial, but this is what I get. Um, so after, after I reduce the, num the, the, uh, the number of workers for, every, for all the OpenStack services, like you have the uh, Nova, Neutron, Cinder, Glance, and so on, so on, for the core services. I reduce the number of workers by half, all right? And after this, I get like a, a 200 processes less on the controllers, on, on the controllers. So from, I, I reduce from 48, the number of workers initially, when you install the OpenStack, most of the time, like if you install your OpenStack with some, whatever you're using for installing OpenStack, but if you're using, the, if, if that installation use Puppet, Usually, Puppet by default set the number of workers to number of uh, equal to your number of CPUs on the server on the controllers. Okay, so I reduce this by half, and I get 200, uh, 200 processes less on the controller, plus the context switching drop to uh, to the value between 10 and 25,000. So probably by half almost, and also when there was no load on the controller, the load was basically again dropped by half to the value of five or something like that. Right, which is probably what I'm looking for, okay? And there was no difference when it comes to like a responsiveness of the OpenStack. I try to repeat the same test. I try to like uh, drop the, the, the VM bomb, right? With the two or 300 VMs and everything was still running perfectly fine, okay? So looks nice. Um, and um, like when you look how exactly the, 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 the OpenStack uh, services are working. So let's say Nova, okay, as an example, right? So the Nova has this, in the configuration file, it has this, this, this option workers. So what is worker means that uh, Nova will start and create X number of API processes, okay? Those are the processes. But inside every single process, Python is running this kind of uh, uh, greenlet or eventlet, uh, which is this kind of, uh, hyper, uh, no, threading for Python, okay? And basically, you can have up to uh, X number of concurrent API calls handled by every single process of Nova API, okay? So, like, in total, you can, you can somehow probably roughly estimate how many, how many API calls your API, uh, API service can take by multiply, multiplying the number of workers, uh, or by squaring actually the number of workers, okay? So this is number of processes multiple by number of uh, greenlets which will be created during the, when, when the Nova is, for example, working. I'll probably explain this later on this. 
Uh, there's one exception, so Keystone is exception. I'll explain this why Keystone has a slightly different architecture, so I'll talk about this later. Uh, so I was saying that the hyper-trading might be actually uh, somehow guilty of this, this, this weird behavior that actually there was, I, I saw like less than 24 running, actively running uh, 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 processes, okay? And there's also this kind of like a, a question to be or not to be, enable the hyper, the, the hyper trading or not enable it. And if you want to enable it, do you want to enable it on the controller or maybe on the compute or what what's are the implication and, and, and so on and so on, okay? So um, what I'm trying to do, so I will try to explain you why and, and, and well, I probably can prove you why you should enable the, 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 the hyper-trading on the controllers. I'm not speaking about the computers. Computers are slightly different, okay? Especially when it comes to telco application again. So how the hyper-trading exactly works, okay? So this is a picture which I basically rip off from the Intel Architectural Software Developer Manual. And uh, it's pretty much how the uh, CPU core looks like. So you have these this two logical processes. So there is a logical process zero and logical process one. And those are the, like the, the hyper-traded CPU. And they have a single uh, execution engine, right? So they, what's happening is that in every single point in time, there's only one of these uh, logical processes which is actively working, right? And this exactly explains the graph with the active processes running. So when I saw the half, only the half of the processes, I mean the active process number was half of the number of CPU. Because with the hyper-trading, even if you have enabled hyper-trading, you will have always, at any single point in time, just the half of the processes running. You cannot have all, all of them running in the same time because they share the execution engine. So just to summarize this, we have uh, two logical processes, single execution engine, um, so each logical CPU has own set of registers, okay? So this helps a lot, all right? So this is, this is probably, this is, this is great. Uh, they share the same level one cache, okay? So if you think about the CPU, and I was telling that you, we have, initially we have uh, 1,100 processes on the, on, the, on the controller. Think, so if you start, do the simple math, you, you, you divide 1,000 by 50, so we end up in around, 20 processes per CPU, okay, per hyper-threaded CPU, all right? If you run the, this, this, this 20 processes per this hyper-threaded CPU, there is a lot of this L1 cache flashing, all right? So those, 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 result, those processes actually are fighting about the space in L1 cache, okay? And then you have to, well, at some point you will have to repopulate the cache from the L2 cache or something like that, okay? And that takes a lot of time. I mean the CPU time. So, uh, but anyway, going back for a second to the hyper-trading, so they, they have the common power saving mechanism, okay? I'll talk about the power savings later on. Uh, so there is a, Inter a while ago actually introduced this hardware support for context switching, and that's great, that helps a lot. But still, because, because of the Intel architecture, the, the, the context switching, the process switching, like putting one active process into the memory and just putting another on one which was sleeping or waiting or something back to the, to, the, to the CPU, make it running again, it takes quite a lot of time, okay? This is, this is very expensive operation. This is why we exactly want to have this, uh, uh, we want to minimize the number of context switches. And the hyper-trading helps a lot with this. So I did yet another test, okay? So this is, this is a graph. I collected this graph over 1,000 seconds or so. And, uh, there is no workload. This is again the controller. And you can see that there are two, two colors. There is a probably, well, it's supposed to be blue, but probably my wife has said that it's not blue. It looks like a green to me, maybe. Uh, so the green dots are the uh, number of context switches when you have the hyper-trading enabled, right? And you can see that it's about, I don't know, 25,000 context switches. But if you disable the context switches, all right, it's, well, less than 40,000, but it's, it's, it's a gigantic difference in the number of the context switches. And you, you don't want really to just like your controller spending time on, on just shifting the processes between the CPU, right? You want to actually save the time and you want the processes to actually doing some real work, not the just housekeeping the, process, the, the, the processes between the CPU, right? So this is why exactly you want to have the hyper-trading enabled on the controllers, all right? 
plus. <coughs> the, most of the OpenStack services is written, well, all of them probably, are written in Python. And uh, uh, like all the web applications, they have this interesting characteristic that like, uh, when their API request is coming, uh, the worker take the request, get some data, do some work, then send it back to the, to the user, and then it's waiting. Then it's waiting milliseconds, 10 milliseconds, 20 milliseconds. That's a lot of time. That's short time for us. But for the CPU, this is gigantic long window time when the, uh, when the API worker gets something back from the user. Okay? And for all this time, the process is sleeping. It's doing nothing. Okay? And this is, this is why, for example, like we, have, we have probably this small number of active processes running. But anyway, uh, for the controllers, again, the hyper-trading should be on. The computes are a different story. Um, keystone. So I said that the keystone is an exception. Okay? So uh, probably most of you is familiar with this kind of like uh, uh, with the worker configuration. You have the keystone file. Uh, you have the default section, and in the default section, you have the public workers, admin workers. Uh, well, Keystone is special because Keystone have this kind of distinction between the public and admin workers. Usually, you have just the workers, and that's all. Uh, so again, what it does, it, cre it will create 48 public uh, workers and 48 admin workers, and every single worker okay, will be able to handle the same number, in my case, 48 concurrent TCP connection or API sessions from the end user, okay? So multiple this, so we have 48 multiple by 48, it's about 2,500, okay? Less, a little bit less than, but 2,500. So unless you are not Google, Amazon, uh, 2,500 concurrent connection to uh, Nova, uh, I don't think so we need it. Maybe. Uh, so, uh, but there's a, there's a, there's a key, uh, so, um, this is old architecture, old Keystone architecture, but Keystone is switching it. And Keystone is probably the first service which is fully switching from the old architecture to the new architecture. So why, why Keystone is actually doing this, okay? Uh, doing multi-process, multi-thread application is tough. It's difficult. Uh, Python global interpreter log. You know what's Py Python Jill? Good. So Python GL doesn't help, right? So the reason why we have all this uh, Python uh, concurrency framework like Python eventlet, Python uh, uh, greenlet, uh, and so on, so on, you, you name it, is because basically Python has a GL, this global interpreter lock, which basically lets you run only just one active process at the time. The real threading doesn't work on Python, okay, on Python application. You have to use something with, like this artificial way of, of running multiple, or, or you fake basically that the Python can run multiple, multiple processes at the same time, okay? This is the problem. Uh, the problem with this Python concurrency frameworks, like, like I said, the greenlet, eventlet, and so on, is that they assume that they are designed to be like the web application, okay? They are designed, they are good for the web application, that you have a request from the end user, you handle the request quickly, you send something back, and then you're waiting. You're waiting few milliseconds, 100 milliseconds, okay? And then the, 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 the threat is doing nothing, okay? But this is not always the case, because like, except UID tokens, we have PKI tokens and Fernet tokens, and those tokens are, uh, are expensive in terms of computation, okay? Those are the tokens which to be like uh, encrypted, signed. So even the verification of the token is quite expensive. The, 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 the encryption stuff, well, you have to spend quite a lot of cycle to actually calculate all this, all, all, all this stuff, right? So the, so the tokens are not, the, 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 the Keystone workload is not really like the light workload, which is done by some web server somewhere on, on, on some portal, okay? So it's slightly different. And uh, the truth is that way, way ago, like servers, web servers like Apache or Nginx or whatever else, they already resolved the problem with this, with this multi-processing multi and multi-threading and, and, this, and this concurrency, okay? So why not use them? And right now, the new architecture, which you probably, when you would take any like the uh, installer, OpenStack installer, and you install it by default, 
your keystone will use this new architecture right now. Okay, so it's slightly different. You have the user which is sending the API request to the to the Apache server. Okay, and then Apache server is managing all this dirty work with the with the co with the pooling and so on so on, with, with handling the, the 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 basic stuff, and then using something what is called WSGI, which stands for the Web Server Gateway Inter Interface. So this is this standard Python uh, interface when you have some kind of web application and Apache is talking using this WSGI to the Keystone backend servers all right and the backend server doing the work sending back and and Apache is basically just like a proxy something like that okay um, so we have this new great architecture great so what could possibly go wrong so uh, there's a few things and actually I spent quite a lot of time <laughs> discovering what's going wrong because um, uh, when when you have the like big installation, like I was doing this installation with 68 servers, with triple O, so you have a quite a lot of like with triple O, you you will end up with probably like a thousand of nested stacks, okay, and there is a lot of the services working in the background, Cinder, Nova, and so on, so on, so on, and all the services actually have a, uh, they have to speak to each other, and. All of them actually they're using Keystone as a common service, common authenticator, right? So all of them have to talk to the Keystone. So the Keystone actually is the most important, uh, well, most important. It's probably the most fragile service. You have to make sure that you have enough workers to handle this. And in the past, it was pretty, pretty simple, okay, with this old configuration. But like, for example, when I start installing the setup with triple O, the default configuration with triple O, I don't know, I'm not sure if it's still there, was that it was probably like a four processes and four, uh, four uh, threads. So in total, I had 60, 60 concurrent uh, API calls which could be handled by Keystone. It's not much if you have uh, over 1,000 thousand of different uh, nested stack in the triple, okay? So I start seeing the problem that the Keystone, starts spi the, the Keystone backend server starts spiking the CPU to 100%. Some things were timing out in random places. And, uh, well, it took me a lot of time to actually understand what's going on. So, like I said on my first slide about Keystone, that was the old configuration, and this is your new configuration. So, get used to it, okay? This is, this is the new place where you're configuring the uh, uh, Keystone, the number of processes, and the number of threads. And, like, I recommend to use the... the, the, the so, you, you, you can see that there is, a, there is a process line, like here, I'm trying to highlight it. Yeah, this is the process line, and this is the threads. And, like I said, because token is not, like, uh, token, uh, sorry, Keystone is, is computation expensive process. So, this is why I would prefer to just put more processes here and just leave the threads with one, because, like I said, Keystone is computational expensive. And, and you want to give a power, you want to actually get this token signed as soon as possible, okay? Um, right. And more OpenStack service is going into this direction, into this architecture. Cellometer is going into this, into this direction. Probably more, most of them will, will be sooner or later running under Apache WSGI. Um, right. So this is never-ending story, the C and P states of CPU. Uh, um, so what are the C and P states? The C states is basically, it, it, it allows you to save some power, okay? It, it allows you to put the uh, CPU into some kind of low power mode or something like that. Uh, it doing, it, it's, it's done in a few different places. So part of the CPU can be idle. Uh, some, like, uh, some of the part of the CPU, physical parts of the CPU can be basically just like a, the clock might be completely switched off. Um, uh, the power might be completely switch, switched off. You can switch off, for example, the power of the L, uh, level one cache or level two cache and so on, so on. And there's no instruction executed, okay? While the P states, it's, it's completely different because the P states uh, uh, allows you to just like, uh, increase or decrease the power of CPU on demand. Using the, you can change the voltage and you can change the dynamically the frequency of the, of the, of the CPU. Even on your laptop, if you check, there's a command uh, which is called CPU power. And this command, this command lets, you, lets you check the, the status and the number of the C states, okay? Um, so uh, in my case, on my survey, I had the five, five C states. 
you can see this here. This is the number of C states. Okay, and, and this, is, this is what's going on. Every single C state except C0 is some kind of, so this is, this is, this is, uh, so we have the C0, C1, C, C2, C4, and so, and so on and so on, okay? So the C0 is the normal operational state of the CPU, okay? You want to have the, your CPU in the C state 0. Uh, and every single next CPU state is basically putting the, 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 the CPU into some kind of like a low power mode or reduce power mode, okay? The, that's great, but the problem with this one is that you have some kind of latency. The latency, the latency comes to the, to the game when you have to exit the state, all right? So like on my server, that was server which was running for a five or a few days. Um, like the deepest sleep state is the C6, okay? And you can see the latency here, which is quite long. This value is actually in microseconds, okay? So uh, going back for a second. So the, the latency of the C0, which is the normal, there's no latency because this is full like a power mode of the CPU. There is no latency here. But the latency of the C1 is the two microseconds. Then you have the latency of the C1e, whatever it is, it's the 10 microseconds, okay? So it's, it's growing. Then you have a next, next, next state, all right? And again, I, I start looking around and I found this, uh, I don't know, sorry. Um, one step back, sorry. So uh, all the C states, they have, they, you can find all these parameters in the sys file system, all right? It, well, if you, if you execute, for example, command like this, uh, I don't see the command. Okay, sorry. Um, oops, I broke something, all right. Okay, I'll probably make the demo when I finish, okay? I don't know how much time I left. Anyway, so all the, all the information about C states you can find in the sys file system, okay? Uh, and the most interesting for us is this latency. We want, we want this latency to be as small as possible or there was no latency at all, okay? This is, this is probably the, the optimal scenario. So this is the table which I, again, copy and paste from the Intel uh, documentation. And they estimate that like, exiting from the C state C1 is about one microsecond, then we have a 156 microseconds, and so on, so on. Those values are not exactly the same, but those values are probably for different type of CPU, and maybe the document was older. But uh, I, was, I was seeing on my server slightly shorter values. But anyway, uh, there's quite a lot of time when actually, look, there's a usage line. So this is how many particular C state was entered. And this is how much time was spent in this C state. So that's a lot of time. And you don't want this time to be wasted, especially on the controller, okay? So what you can do about this? There's a few things. The first thing, the more intrusive is probably go to the BIOS and change a few settings. There's usually some power management stuff. You want to just create some custom profile or something like that and set everything to the high performance, whatever, okay, you have, all right? Max speed. Then the next option is to just use those two kernel parameters, okay? Those things basically, those kernel parameters uh, don't disable the C states in the hardware, but they like uh, hide it from the kernel, okay? And the next thing, the last thing, is probably the less intrusive, but if you start looking in this path, in the sys file system, there is a disable, disable file. If you write something to this file, like one, you will disable the particular C states. But you have to do this for all CPUs. This is why you have a star here, for all CPUs. And you want to do this for all states. And in this way, you can put your CPU into the this highest possible power mode, the fastest possible scenario. This is what we want. And believe me, you can spend a lot of time, waste a lot of time, actually. My, the waste is better word to use it troubleshooting this kind of like a performance stuff which is related to this, to this because it's difficult to actually try to discover that this is the problem. Block trace, all right, this is the cool stuff. So what is block trace? Has anyone heard about block trace? One, good. <laughs> so block trace is something like uh, IOSTAT on steroids, okay? Uh, it's, uh, it allows you to, the, to uh, it's kind of S-trace for the IOSAT system. It talks directly to the kernel, 
and it takes pretty much it, it allows you to trace every single IO request to every single block device you have which is pretty cool block trace how to use it this is you can copy and paste this and that will work for you so w what's going on here I just create some directory in the first line in the second line so uh, think about this the S the block trace writes quite a lot of data but you don't want to write those data to the drive which you are actually trying to trace okay it doesn't make sense right because then you will have this this obfuscated results okay and you don't want to do this so this is why you can use the tmpfs or for example some kind of ramfs uh, to store the data okay so in my case i just create some kind of four gigs uh, four gigs uh, well directory okay then i just basically the last command execute the, the the block trace and it will run it will collect the data it will set the file and you have to just press control c and it will stop okay and then then you have to analyze it there's a there's a little bit of documentation uh, uh, there's a special tool which is called btt which basically the, the block parse and btt those are the tools which allows you to just somehow analyze because the block trace write data the results into binary format so you have to just somehow make it readable for you so this is this is how the out, output from the from the block trace looks like okay so the mo the, there's 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 a lot of stuff i don't remember exactly what what, what exactly which command means but like you have some block uh, minor and major number of the block device um, the interesting parts are the the, the 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 columns with the capital letters like those two okay and you have for example the next number is the number of the block on the disk like for example that was let's say sda drive so that was the block number well this is the block number which i for example the ws means that it's write and sync okay like you have the wsm which means the write sync and modify okay this is this is how you i'll i'll, I'll have more 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 description about the, the 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 acronyms on the next slide and you have the you have the block you have the size of the request okay so this is in blocks uh, uh, if I'm not mistaken and then you have a process so like MySQL some system D and so on all right this is how it looks like uh, right so the two columns the two important columns the one column is the action and the more interesting is the category okay so in the category you will find the read which is you have the capital R you have the ops you have the write, which is capital W. You have the flash, and so on, so on. Based on this kind of letters, you can you can decode what's really what's going on with the process. What kind of <coughs> request your process was was generating? Okay. Um, and again, few results. So this graph shows I, I did a I did a little bit of analysis, some big data four gig of data still big data for me at least <laughs> so uh, 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 this is like the sum of the IOPS generated pay pro per process so you can see the uh, on the horizontal line there is a there are all bunch of different different processes and uh, on the vertical you have the numbers you have a number of uh, the IOPS number generated by process and this is logarithmic scale okay so this is important so um, the thing is that like there is a, there's this one spike which is probably not interesting for us because this is k worker which k worker is the uh, kernel process which is really doing the writes to the disk it's basically right it's a kernel space uh, uh, process which is writing the data or reading the data from the drive on behalf of the user space process okay so this is this is why actually is the is the main process for doing the write with the physical device with your physical drive okay but then next you have the mysql you have the mongo so the mysql and mongo are the winners okay there is also a swapper which i don't know how to explain this but the, because i haven't seen any swapping on my system but the swapper is still here so that's some kind of mystery to me but then you have you have you have a neutron <clears throat> neutron server you have a uh, you have a cinder api and so on so on but bear in mind that this is this is logarithmic scale so the 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 biggest iops consumers are mongodb and mysql <clears throat> and they are really like the difference between the the mariadb and 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 mongodb the difference between the next one the next iops uh, generators it's really gigantic because this is at least like a 10 times uh, difference 
Okay? So a little bit more breakdown, and this is the number of writes. And the number of writes actually, uh, well, doesn't look interesting, but again, the scale is interesting. Because the scale is uh, 100,000, while on the previous slide we have 10 to the sixth, right, to the power of six, which is, again, 10 times. And uh, this is the write, the sum of the write request. And again, the winner is MySQL and MariaDB. So, and those stats were collected over six hours, okay? So this is, this is again, the, the stats I collected while I was doing my, my, my test with my workload, right? So, um, and, and, and uh, I'm not sure if that's actually visible for you. Maybe I'll try to make it, make it bigger. Uh, oops, no, I can't. Okay, anyway. So on this graph, And the last one is the right. And if you look closer on this, on this graph, you can see that the, like a majority, like a 90% of the IO requests are the writes. There's very little actually reads generated by all the processes. So this is, this is quite an interesting, this is quite an interesting workload, which is mostly the, 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 the writes. I, I, I expected that, that the, they will have a lot of writes, but I didn't expect that it will be so much of them. Um, and the winners are MariaDB and MongoDB. Uh, so what we can do about this, right? So uh, about the MariaDB, <clears throat> there's probably quite a lot of different things you can do. Uh, what I did and what actually helps me a lot, uh, with the three controllers we run, of course, Galera cluster, and uh, you don't need binary locks. You can disable binary locks. If you run Galera, binary locks are basically useless. Maybe you are not completely useless, but you don't really need them, okay? And uh, the next thing is this, this, this inodb flash lock at TRX commit value, right? Which is probably a little bit controversial, but uh, it's controversial because if you run the single my, like, database instance with these settings, it will make your database faster, but you can lose data, okay? But if you're running Galera cluster, right? Even if one of the cluster members will go down and he will lose some kind of rights, okay? Then it will come back it will talk to the rest of the control, the, 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 the MariaDB uh, cluster members, Galera cluster members, right? And it will realize, okay, I'm probably missing some, uh, some commits. And it will just pull, populate the data from the, 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 the remaining actively running uh, uh, cluster members. And uh, there is no risk of losing data. So for the, for the, for the Galera cluster, actually, it makes sense to use this setting. Uh, I'm not the MariaDB expert, so I'm not going to actually give you an advice about the MongoDB, um, and that's probably it. Uh, so key takeaways. Uh, you probably know how important is context switching, uh, the load, how the hyper-trading is working, and what's, what's exactly the impact on the controllers. Uh, the API workers, you really don't need so many API workers, okay? The CPU, CNP states, don't forget to disable them on the controllers, the block trace, which is pretty cool stuff, but it takes quite a lot of time to actually get some useful conclusion out of the data. Um, and the interesting, the controller workload characteristic, I didn't expect to see that many writes on the controller, okay? This is, this is, this is surprising even for me. Uh, questions? No questions. Right. Oh, there's one question. Uh, I guess my only question was, was your only workload the spinning up and stopping of the machines? Did you actually have the machines do anything? Uh, no, I didn't put any workload inside the VMs, no. But that wasn't my point, because like, the, the, even if I put some workload to the VMs, it wouldn't affect the controllers in any way. I was running, like I was creating the VMs, I was deleting the VMs, I was uh, firing the stack concurrently, I was deleting them in the same time. Okay, I, I tried to just like uh, really put the controllers down, but uh, run, I was thinking about running the, the, some kind of workload inside the VMs, but for the controllers it probably doesn't really matter. All right, so thank you everybody.